So welcome everyone to uh, session titled Smart Cities in Japan, Europe, and Asia, uh, Realizing Co-Creation Across Regions. I'm Takunango, MC of this session, Executive, uh, Executive Managing Director of Smart City Institute of Japan. So uh, today you have 60 minutes of discussion, starting from the presentation by all of the esteemed presenter today, and then we'll have a more open discussion later on. And in the order of uh, presentation, let me introduce all of the uh, uh, presenter today. Uh, first person is uh, Dr. Mori, uh, city of Tsukuba. Uh, Dr. Yusuke Mori, general manager of Tsukuba city. And the uh, second person is the Professor Martin Brinskov, chair of Open and Agile Smart Cities. The third person is Ms. Chris Rubinow, executive director and chief sustainability of Smart City. And the last, last person is uh, Mr. Kenji Matsuno, uh, Cabinet Officer of Japan. Okay, and the uh, whole purpose of this session is to talk about the common issues, common challenges we are faced with in the building of smart cities in Europe, Asia, and Japan. And uh, we'll find out the common pockets that we can share, and uh, hopefully we can discuss what we can do together as a next step. All right. And uh, without further ado, let's move on to the presentation. So, Morisan. Okay, thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for inviting me to this important session. So it's my great honor to talk, give a talk at the Asia Smart City Conference. My name is Yusuke Mori. Um, I'm in the city of Tsukuba as uh, Director General since 2019. Before joining the city, I was working at the Education and Science Ministry at the national government and also the cabinet office. So I'll be talking about some smart city projects which are currently going on in Tsukuba. Tsukuba city has continued to develop since Tsukuba Science City construction plan approved by the Japanese cabinet in 1963. Today, the city has a population of 245,000 and we see 3,500 increase every year which is very rare in Japan, where severe aging and decline of the population have been observed. 20,000 citizens engage in research and development activities, and 8,000 are PhD holders, that is 10 times as dense as Japan's average. And we are proud of four Nobel laureates in Tsukuba. Also, the city is home to 150 research institutes. Location is very good. 45 minutes from Tokyo and 60 minutes from two international airports. Now, what's the mission of Tsukuba? I believe our mission is to contribute to humankind by improving people's lives through science and technology. Tsukuba City has, the, has set the mission of a city with science and technology for citizens in Tsukuba's future plan, which is city's top priority strategic plan. Here, I'd like to introduce some examples of Tsukuba City's projects on smart city. The first example is about mobility. Tsukuba City has been actively developing projects to promote next generation mobility and selected for smart city model projects by the Japanese government. We have tested a self-driving electric cart on public streets for the first time in Japan. This technology would help elderly and disabled persons who have difficulty with mobility, such as going shopping to a clinic, etc. In addition, we are promoting experiments of the face recognition technologies for cashless, cashless payment for public bus and check-in to the hospital and clinic at the same time. Second example of our effort is to make the election online. The current Japan's election system is paper-based like most of the countries that voters have to go to the polling place and write candidate's name on a piece of paper. This graph shows voter turnout of 2020 Cuba's mayoral election. As you see, percentage of younger generation and over 80 are very low. Additionally, although voter turnout in Japan's election was originally on the decline in trend, there are concerns that the spread of the COVID-19 could further reduce the rate. In fact, the turnout for the mayoral election in another city decreased by 25 points. 
When I did a small survey with college and graduate students at Scuba University, more than 90% of respondents said they are willing to use internet voting when established, and uh, half of the respondents answered that they, they would have voted if they have be, they had, they ha there had been internet voting system at 2020 election. Scuba City has been working with startups to create online voting system for three years. To secure personal identification and secret vote, we combined Japan's individual number card, known as My Number Card, and biometric authentication technology, as well as blockchain, blockchain encryption. We hope we will be able to use it for election in the near future, like 2024 Scuba's mail or election, and contribute to those who have difficulty to go to the polling place. The third project I'm going to talk about is digitalization of health management at schools. In Tsukuba City, all elementary and junior high schools were closed in March of 2020 due to the expansion of COVID-19. For reopening the schools, we decided to collaborate with our startup company from the Tsukuba University um, called Lever to digitalize the children's physical condition management of all of the elementary and junior high schools using smartphone app. Before this app had been introduced, children's body temperatures were written down on a sheet of paper by parents at home, and then teachers collect them at the entrance of school and check whether they are healthy or not. It's now done by their parents through the app at home, which could reduce the burden of the teachers and also decrease direct contact between teachers and students. To be honest, I thought um, only a few would use the app because it was not mandatory, but voluntary basis. However, surprisingly, now 90% of parents are active users. The app enables parents to record and share their kids' physical condition with the school. And if their kids are not healthy, they could also consult with the doctor with the same very same app. At the same time, this system allows school to monitor average body temperature of each class or school so that, so that the sign of the spread of infection could be detected earlier and quick countermeasures could be taken. Currently, the Japanese government has been promoting super city. It's like a super version of a smart city under which technology is utilized regulations are relaxed and various data are connected. Scuba City is actively participating in this scheme and we call it Scuba Super Science City, provides new options by science, provide diverse well-being for citizens. We aim to create a community where citizens are connected to each other and to the city, where people can make full use of their diverse capabilities and where everyone can harness top level scientific and technological knowledge in solving various issues in the community. We are planning to provide more than 20 services as you see in blue squares for the public good. To do these projects, a wide range of data will be utilized ranging from individual attributes to orientation. For this reason, ethical issues such as ensuring data security, system safety and transparency, as well as consensus building among citizens need to be continuously discussed and taken care of concurrently with the introduction of such technology. So we published the ethical principles for Tsukuba Smart City. There are four pillars, respect for autonomy, like guarantee transparency so that citizens can make decisions based on their understanding, understanding of the mechanism, no male beneficence, beneficence, justice, like um, all residents shall be treated fairly and impartially regardless of their age, gender, race, religion, ideology, economic circumstances, etc. By implementing those projects, we would like to show how the future looks like from Tsukuba. Thank you for your attention. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mori, Morisa. And uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Martin, mic is yours. Thank you so much. Do you hear me well? 
And thank you for the for the nice presentation from Scuba. I think this is an excellent example, in fact, <clears throat> of um, what every local community, whether it's the local authority or it's the more regional or it's um, even uh, at the neighborhood level, what every local city or community has to think about. Because something is happening, definitely. We can call it smart cities, we can call it digitalization, transformation, <clears throat> but it is a paradigm shift. And I would like to offer just a few uh, thoughts on that from my side, and especially on this occasion, how we can work together in the global regions uh, to formulate something which is, in fact, in common, so that we can actually deliver this improvement of life for citizens everywhere. So thank you for the invitation here. My name is Martin Brunsko, and I'm chair of the organization, the global network uh, of local networks called Open Agile Smart Cities. And I'm a university professor at Aarhus University in Denmark. I don't want to go into so much detail there. Uh, but just a quick uh, overview of uh, the footprint of the members of OASC, so covering uh, big parts of the world, not everywhere, um, but we have Japanese members and are very happy about the very active collaboration, very practically, both on technology, of course, but also on policy, on local uh, experience that can be shared, just as we heard before from the colleague. We have lots of partners and what we call strategic partners, including, uh, well, the United Nations, World Economic Forum, European Commission in Europe, and uh, many both standardization fora and other networks. Um, there's three dots, so there are many more. But just to say that we try to ensure that we understand what's going on and we don't try to duplicate work, but only to uh, facilitate uh, a formulation of helpful uh, best practices and specifications that can be used everywhere. This is a little bit a view from where I sit when I'm at the university in Aarhus in Denmark. So there's these actions on one hand, so that's very concrete projects that are maybe pilots or experiments. And then on the other hand, there are ecosystems local ecosystems where people work together and share uh, knowledge, experience, but they're also more global regional, so European or uh, other global regions. And then there's these more global ecosystems. And I find that the combination of actions and ecosystems is really at the heart here. And then in between there is standardization, there's policy development, again, on all of these levels. So I would say there is a paradigm shift going on. Some of you will remember that back in the 90s, the motto was that software is eating the world when you know the internet was really taking off commercially. I would say now that that virtualization is taking place, very literally, finding place on the ground where we all live, in our local communities, in the cities, and so on. And this is something very, very different than just virtualizing everything in the cloud. And that is a challenge that we need to address together. Here is perhaps a very busy uh, schematic of how I see the elements. But just very simply, the green is the technical virtualization which I think is not so difficult. It's a technical exercise from data spaces, data platforms to digital twins. Then below there's the computing continuum, you know, from the, the 5G and the uh, broadband uh, in, in the ground until the far edge of these devices that we have everywhere that can sensor up until the cloud and the high performance computing. We know, elements there, but it's not a continuum yet, but we need to understand what needs to happen where. And the big shift is that data is shifting to the edge instead of moving everything to the cloud. So data stays on the edge 
unless when we really need some high performance. So there's a shift there that we need to understand. And it's very costly, of course, to deploy new infrastructure. So let's understand those developments well before we invest in it. Then the red one is the communities of practice around the technologies and the computing continuum. And this is where it gets really problematic. We know how to share data. <clears throat> we also know how data platforms work, some very successful ones from the US, from China and the industrial side, but they are very uh, particular in the philosophy of how they have been set up. They are really virtualizing. They're not so much observing the needs on the ground. And then on top of that, when we have complex modeling, ge uh, geospatial information, building information management in the manufacturing, and even the virtual machines that we put in every device that could hold and operate a complex model, a digital twin, if you will. We don't have a good com connection between these communities of practice in the municipalities, in the cities, the geospatial colleagues are very good at working with geospatial data. And even though some of those practices would be helpful in other parts of the organization, uh, it's not so easy to get that logic to work across. And then of course, we need to reflect this on all the levels of governance. I just give here EU, European Union as the example of a global region, but then there's the member state, which is, is called in European terms, the national level, the regional, the local, the community, and then there's your the place where you are. And of course, there's the global level. So the concern here from OASC is how can we make something minimal that is common across all of these levels so that the relevant decisions and appropriations can happen locally. So I'm going to conclude um, with just an example. Um, we see a lot of development all uh, over the world, in fact, and we would like to see the collaboration which is encouraged here at the conference to continue so that we learn from each other. And <clears throat> one example is the recently published Danish Guide to Sustainable Digital Transformation. And there's seven very simple um, recommendations. It will be available soon in English, I think it will be um, uh, just after this conference. Um, but really, there are some simple, seemingly simple advice to be picked up. And if we take number three here, of course, you should focus on data, you should build with interfaces, but to ensure a minimum of interoperability, that is really going to be essential, I think, and we think. So we would like to encourage <clears throat> this conversation also to focus on what do we have in common? It's not everything, but what can we decide so that we understand how to preserve privacy, to work with artificial intelligence, to ensure that our data about, well, the places we live in, the geospatial information is consistent and that we can use it when we buy systems in the market to have choice, efficiency uh, in the systems. This is what we would like to see. So I think I will stop there and uh, say thank you for the invitation here to the conversation. And I look very much forward to this global uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Martin, for the excellent presentation. And uh, thank you. Actually, it's nice way of setting the stage and the framework for our discussion. Uh, on the topic of the commonality across the nations. Uh, let's talk about that. All right, let's move on to the third presentation. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Tak. Uh, thank you, Martin. Let me share my screen. Okay. So again, hi, everyone. And Thank you again to Tat, to Kudo, and of course to the SCI Japan team for inviting me and I'm really privileged to be part of this um, panel. Again, I am Chris Libunau and I'm the executive director of Smart City. I am coming in here with the lens from data stewardship, urban planning, project management, and more than a decade of government policy consultancies. 
So today, I'm going to share with you some insights about smart cities in Southeast Asia that I know you'll find interesting. I only have you know, a few minutes, so I hope that by the end of my talk, I can give you some food for thought for on, on the smart city approaches that which requires urgent need or urgent need in terms of our attention and action as well. So the smart city concept is not new. Smart city, as, as uh, we already know, usually refers to the use of uh, data and technologies in cities and communities, right? So it doesn't matter if we name them resilient cities, sustainable cities, digital cities, they are already here and have been for years. Now let's talk about Southeast Asia, which is a hotbed for mega cities or the areas with more than one, um, 10 million people. And each one of these particular cities already started its smart city journey. So in short, smart city is just inescapable, of course, with the ultimate goal of improving the people's quality of life. So it begs the question, what are the societal challenges that this particular smart city concepts are trying to solve in ASEAN? First, while cities are becoming increasingly independent or decentralized, urbanization is also rising in middleweight cities, which are the cities that is 500,000 with 500,000 population to 5 million. Urban sprawl with a high rate of car use is also experienced in Southeast Asia, together with inequality in different sectors. Next would be the non-communicable diseases, which is obesity, you know, urban stress are also on the rise, making the aging population more vulnerable. And of course, climate change. For instance, Jakarta is sinking faster than any particular major city in the planet. And last but not the least, here you would find cybersecurity threats. So Microsoft found that ASEAN encounter rates were twice the global average in terms of cybersecurity threats. Most, if not all, you know, ASEAN ministers meeting that were held uh, lately highlighted that digitalization is now closely linked to the country's economic development. And I am sure that most of us here are already aware of the ASEAN Smart Cities Network, which is established in 2018, and it currently has 26 member cities. Now let's take a look at several smart city practices in Southeast Asia. First, both Singapore and Brunei aim to become smart nation with a really strong government support. Similar can be observed in Thailand. Um, they have the Thailand 4.0 plan, which aims to achieve 100 smart cities by next year. And of course, the Indonesia's 100 smart cities movement by 2045. In Cambodia, Myanmar, Vietnam, and Laos, the ASEAN and the uh, other multilateral partnership with Japan, of course, and others are present. Last but not the least is Malaysia. Both Malaysia and the Philippines have their own smart city frameworks. So for Malaysia, the, the, the smart city framework is a guide to local authorities, while in the Philippines, it mostly caters to researchers and scientists as well. With this, there's also a lot of digital projects individually. So even cities and other multilateral pro uh, partners have their own digital projects. And we can really see that ASEAN and the Southeast Asian uh, society, like um, elsewhere, is really going digital. However, and this is a big, you know, however, <laughs> did you know that less than 20% of the digital government projects in developing countries are successes? So that's more than 80% of failed digital government projects. And as Martin mentioned earlier, it's quite expensive. And yet, 
we are still hyping digitized services, but not really addressing the a history of e-government failures. So in fact, in our research, well, which we did in 2020, we found that the current smart city approaches pose real challenges to our society, risks and challenges actually. So here are the top three problems that we still fail to address. Number one, we it's too technology centered. So digital projects are, are treated separately from policy, from bureaucracy, and even from the capacity of the citizens. Number two, there's a data problem. So there's lack of open data, data governance, you name it. And number three, it's there's no buy-in really and a lack of public support. So for example, the COVID tracing app uh, that we have in the Philippines, after a year, the government accepted, finally accepted that it had little to no use in managing the pandemic. And this is why you know the smart city as an organization exists. We advocate and implement open source and interoperability. We are evangelizing open data at the city level. And our long-term strategy really is to boost data and digital literacy of the community. So before I end, here's a bit of honesty and some real talk. I have been working with the government for more than a decade and there are a lot of great funded projects and plans but are now gathering cobwebs somewhere and we created smart city as an organization out of this frustration currently many organizations talk about people-oriented cities but the reality is the same organizations sadly even ngos and investors work with the same people and with the same approach and on the e-government projects that failed the developing countries already. So technology is easy, but culture is hard. And at the end of the day, without the public realizing the value of data, the value of technology, all the efforts will be pointless. So smart cities can be really uh, powerful and game changing. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, as a genius once said, with great power comes great responsibility. So, again, I am Chris from Smart City, and here's our contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Tak, and thanks, everyone. Thank you, Chris. I have really uh, agreed that you bring in. The technology is easy, but culture is hard. I completely agree with you, right? And thank you for bringing in the Asian uh, perspective to the table. Let's discuss about that later. Thank you very much. And uh, let's move thank on you. to the final presenter, uh, Matsuno-san. Over to you. Yes. Uh, thank you for inviting to this uh, important session. I'm Kenji Matsuno from uh, Cabinet Office, the Government of Japan. I'm actually currently in charge of a super city, which uh, mentioned by Morisan a little bit. It's uh, like the top level version of the smart city, whatever smart city is. So we are now currently in the process of selecting the uh, leading model of the smart city in Japan. So uh, I, it's very so it's very honored to for me to join to this uh, conversation with uh, great colleagues, who, some of who I know. Um, actually, I was in Brussels uh, until this summer, and I was working with uh, uh, EU institutions, and I also had a chance to talk to OASC people. And it was very interesting, interesting, inspiring. So it's very honored to be uh, a part of this discussion. So. As Martin and Chris mentioned, smart cities is uh, taking place everywhere, and uh, it's kind of a inevitable phenomenon. But the smart city, in my view, smart city is not a concrete idea, and uh, it depends on what what the smart city is. 
uh, means is uh, depends on the context in which uh, each country or each municipality cities are located and it's different from one another but so why we have to i would like to talk about why we have to uh, collaborate uh, i mean we it's uh, japan europe asia and, and also americas um, why we have to collaborate yeah, cooperate in the context of promoting the smart cities uh, it's in a, in very short while it's we because we have a uh, common challenges and uh, smart city is a, a unique solution to uh, address those common challenges so we have to collaborate at the various levels from government to government global international and uh, city to city and people to people so let me first uh, introduce why the Japan is promoting a smart city. Japanese government is promoting smart city. It's partly mentioned by Morrison's presentation, but uh, the first priority for Japan is the dealing with the population decline. As you can see, uh, after 20, uh, 2008, I think, it, Japan, Japanese population started to decline and the Japanese aging rate has almost hit, uh, it's on the right axis, but you can see, see it now, but it's almost, currently it's 28, 8%. So almost one in three in Japanese people are the over 65. It's a huge burden to the uh, Japanese society and the economy. For example, the, it's, it has become a big challenge for the sustainability of the social security system. But it's not only about social security system. The labor shortage has been uh, happening in a wide range of sectors, construction industries, um, uh, transport industries, everywhere. Uh, the we are uh, in a short of uh, labor forces so we need to have a more uh, sustainable model of social security uh, mobility and every kind of industry so this is the biggest challenge for us and uh, also it's a, a little bit more global challenge but uh, Japan has been hit by uh, big disasters. Currently, we are today actually we are hit by a ty big typhoon. But every year we are facing uh, uh, big uh, disasters such as uh, flooding. Uh, this is uh, one from last year, and it's uh, the river has flooded, and uh, all the one of the city in the south of Japan has been inundated. It. And uh, climate change has, uh, it, it is expected that the climate, because of the climate change, the, those uh, floodings and the severe uh, climate, uh, 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 severe uh, weather cases will be uh, more frequent. And so we need to work together to stop this, uh, the impact of climate change by our working to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions, but also we have to work to, together to share knowledge about uh, climate adaptation, like uh, disaster risk management. And uh, finally, we are now facing uh, COVID-19. Japan has been, uh, in cases in Japan has been low in the early stages, but recently were in the, this summer, we. Have, we have seen a big surge of the cases. And uh, as, as a result, we, ha we have to uh, adapt. And uh, sorry, the, uh, this trend, it's, uh, the cases has been suppressed recently, but uh, we don't know what's going to happen in the future, whether it will continue to continue to stay or uh, it will it be over with the uh, vaccination, we don't know, but uh, we have to change our lifestyles to adapt to the, uh, this new situation by uh, introduce promoting remote works, 
and other other way of uh, other way of life. So these challenges uh, have uh, pushes us to the transition of the economy and the society. And I think the innovation is a driver of the transition and it's happening everywhere. Like, uh, as you know, the transition is happening everywhere. For example, as uh, Morrison explained, the new types of mobility like autonomous vehicles or uh, electric vehicles, not, it's not only helping the people who have difficulty about, about mobility, but it also helps the uh, helps us uh, cope with the climate change because electric vehicle, electric connected vehicles will uh, also work as a uh, energy uh, uh, energy uh, battery, so it can reduce the use of the uh, uh, fossil fuels. So it's gonna help us cope with the climate change. And for example, other examples include uh, medical healthcare like uh, remote, uh, remote education or remote health medication that those transitions are happening everywhere. And also the, this transition will be supported by the uh, common data plot platform. As, uh, this is uh, one example, one image of the uh, common data platform, but uh, the data uh, digital transition uh, is uh, which is happening in the uh, each field or each sectors will itself uh, improve the efficiency of those services but connecting those services with, with the common data platform will allow the new new types of innovation by like connecting uh, transport and tourism or connecting transport with education or social welfare or finance that will allow, allow us to uh, innovate, uh, create a new kind of services. So this uh, connecting those different services is, is with a common data platform will be a key, one, uh, one important feature in the future uh, as a smart city. So these are what we are expecting for the smart, uh, smart city and uh, also our super cities. And, uh, but uh, there are some kind of perspectives for, for smart cities. Uh, in promoting smart cities, the Japanese government has uh, identified as a few points to think about in, uh, in the smart cities. Uh, some of them are already mentioned, like uh, uh, privacy, uh, openness, transparency, and the data security. And I would also like to add the ethical guidelines, which uh, Morrison uh, mentioned in uh, his presentation. Those, um, uh, those, uh, those kind of things are will be uh, important in pro promoting smart cities. And also uh, another important thing is that uh, it, the smart city has to be citizen centered. When promoting smart cities, it sometimes focus too much on technologies and uh, sometimes the citizens point of view are left behind. And if the, the smart city becomes too technology oriented, it will not be supported by citizens and uh, those projects will be uh, uh, will be uh, will be uh, faring in in the in the in the end so it has to be citizen centered and it has to reflect the challenges at the local level and Finally, there uh, it has to be much sectoral approach. It has to take much sectoral approach, which I already mentioned. It has to be sector wide, it, and uh, it I think it also needs to be uh, based on the common data platform, and uh, also the partnership principles. It's uh, 
it has to be uh, based on uh, collaborations with uh, uh, other cities and also in other international partners. And finally, I'd like to uh, talk about international cooperation. As I, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, we are facing uh, the challenges we are facing is uh, not only uh, for the not only for Japan or it's it's uh, it's a common challenge over all over the world. So we have to share experiences uh, to uh, to make the smart cities better and uh, and the, so. Uh, when it comes to uh, Asian partners, uh, as, uh, as Chris mentioned, the ASEAN has been uh, promoting uh, smart, city, uh, smart cities and the ASEAN Smart City Network project. And Japanese government has been uh, supporting uh, as a uh, ASEAN's partner through uh, a collaborate, uh, collaborative platform, which is called JASCA which consists of ministries, cities, and uh, also with the public sector, uh, representatives from public sectors like JICA and other uh, government entities. And we also uh, engage with the uh, public companies and other organizations to support the uh, smart city initiatives of ASEAN, uh, ASEAN countries. When it comes to EU, uh, European uh, smart city project, uh, in 2018, uh, uh, Japan and the EU has uh, con uh, concluded a strategic partnership agreement, and we are uh, enhancing cooperations with the EU. And in this context, we are collaborating at the city. To, we are conducting a city-to-city -city cooperation, which is called uh, International Urban Cooperation Project. Uh, this is a final event of International Urban Cooperation Project, last, which was held last year. And the project has been uh, continuing as a new, uh, the second phase from this year. And the smart cities and other topics, including uh, aging and uh, uh, climate change, are uh, included in the project. So we are collaborate, also collaborating with Euro European cities to. Uh, uh, with regards to smart cities. So um, from, through these collaborations, I think that uh, we can share uh, our practices, our knowledges and the uh, challenges we're facing, and uh, we can collaborate each other to uh, better improve how we uh, promote smart cities. And this uh, seminar is, I think, it's a very good opportunity to enhance these kind of cooperations. And I think this will be contrib contribute to the uh, better uh, po uh, policy promotion in the Japan and ASEAN and Europe. So very, I'm uh, very excited to join uh, for the later discussion. And thank you for, thank you again for inviting to this important session. Thank you. Thank you, Mori -san, uh, uh, Machiro san All right, so we uh, first uh, completed the first part of this session. So everyone show up, uh, we will spice up to the discussion session. And uh, everyone presented uh, different uh, you know, uh, parts of the, uh, the small city project. Uh, Mori -san, uh, presented the local government practice and the strong emphasis on science, R&D and ethics as one of the uh, practice already uh, exercised in the city of Tsukuba. And uh, Martin was, uh, you know, uh, representing almost a global uh, perspective rooted in Europe, but Europe is a fast runner, forerunner of the smart city project in the world. So uh, he, uh, Martin, thank you for uh, sharing kind of a perspective, global perspective. Uh, it's open, that's why we are, you know, uh, discussing this together with the Asian uh, partners and Japanese partners. And, uh, uh, and uh, Chris also presented the uh, Asian perspective. And, uh, you know, we share a lot of same same issues, technology, technology versus uh, culture, uh, reality versus, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the ideal situations, 
And uh, we'd like to work together with Asian countries as well, right? And uh, uh, Matsumo-san presented the Japanese government standpoint. Uh, he uh, presented the case of the super city, which is underway right now. And we'd like to come up with the flagship uh, cities called super city, uh, showcasing the futuristic view of the Japanese smart cities going forward. So we kind of collectively shared the same common platform to discuss going forward right now. All right. So let's talk about you know the uh, what things we would like to uh, share. Uh, with, with what uh, which part of this must be uh, elements we would like to share among these members. Let's assume that we are the you know habitants of the village coming from different parts of the village, right? And then we are now talking about the collaboration, right? And then uh, the smart city covers a lot of different things, the traditional urban issues, uh, traffic congestions, you know, environment, uh, gentrification, gap between wealthy and poverty, uh, healthcare, education, digital government, COVID-19, climate changes, uh, capacity building, uh, policy making, what not, there are many. So from your standpoint, what are the top three items you would like to bring into onto the table and discuss collaborations? Let's start from uh, Morisan. Okay, um, so smart city city initiatives are underway around the world, as uh, everyone mentioned at their speech. And the aim of this initiative is to address issues facing the community and to achieve the well-being of the people in the community. And these issues um, vary depending on community and so on how each community address issues will also vary. So it's kind of very hard to find that, you know, the common things we can share, but uh, from the understand uh, standpoint of the, you know, importance of difference, um, you know, this means that uh, there's um, as many initiatives being tested simultaneously as their smart cities. Uh, so the, by sharing these initiatives, particularly successful ones with the rest of the world, we can accelerate the realization of smart cities and create large markets um, that, that will help uh, make smart cities sustainable. And of course, you know, there should be the common things like ethics, but uh, in my perspectives, sometimes, you know, even ethics could be very um, culture by culture. So um, again, um, it's very important to share the cases from the best cases to our, you know, the negative cases and find out the possible um, the shared um, way to uh, deal with such um, difficulties to overcome together um, by using you know, this kind of the conference itself or, you know, the organization like OS, OASC, I think. Yeah, thank you very much, Morisan. So let's see from the city of Tsukuba, which one do you think we will, uh, do you recommend to share? Maybe uh, internet voting, uh, the, uh, the, the healthcare using a lever or mobility, which one do you recommend? Uh, well, we have uh, more than 10 years experience in mobility. So I think we have um, a kind of strong evidence in, for example, to what extent we can um, use the mobility um, in terms of, you know, uh, the users or speeds, the, um, the widthness of the roads, etc. So I think we have a strong, um, the strong point in mobility. And, but the, um, actually in Japan, it's a case uh, of Japan, the internet voting has not been uh, in, in, uh, introduced yet. Um, so if I, if I talk about um, only in Japan, uh, internet voting um, could be the best, um, project we can share um, to other districts. But uh, as you know, uh, that many countries like Estonia, the US, and uh, I think then, 
yeah, uh, the, some European countries have already introduced the internet voting. So I'm expecting the, you know, um, them sharing those, um, sharing their knowledge and experience and learn uh, from those experience to develop our idea for internet voting in the near future. Thank you very much, Morisan. Okay, let's move on to Martin. So in your case, you have a lot of different cases from Europe and uh, around the world, and you already created a lot of framework and also uh, infrastructure as well. So which one do you recommend to share with all of the members? Mm, it's very, very <laughs> challenging. I really like the comment that even the Essex has a very, very particular flavor or tone when you come to the local level. <clears throat> you, you, if I understood you correctly, um, you said three things to share. Um, <clears throat> I think, I think that, that in my experience, if I may be a little less specific, because there are very many good examples, but, but let me give a little bit of context to it, if you allow me. I think it's very, very important to recognize what was also voiced before, that there's a technical challenge mm -hmm. and there is a, let's call it a cultural challenge, whether it's organization or it's culture and so on. These are not easy to directly connect, but we cannot disconnect them. We cannot just la make legislation and political decisions and then just hope technology sort of matches those expectations. So there has to be a close coordination between the technical development <clears throat> and what we need to deliver in a particular city or region or country or wherever. So that's, <clears throat> that's one point. The next point is that I don't think that it's so easy to export or to replicate end-to-end -end services. I think we will see a much more fruitful uh, scaling or sharing of parts of this service delivery. Oh. <clears throat> so the architectural framework will not be that we take these big architectures and move them around. I think it would be more like particular capabilities we need so if we have a problem with congestion or we have a problem with, I don't know, uh, some citizen service or something, then we can take the element that would help, you know, bring us to the next level. But it wouldn't fix the entire, you know, e-voting or something like that. But it would be an element, whether it's the privacy part or it's the, I don't know, the analytics or something. So I think we are moving towards a much more microservice oriented uh, service delivery oh. and then I think these bits and pieces a little bit like the modular blocks they can then travel because then you don't have to export or import the entire system you can you can have it much more on a modular basis which can be you know taken forward by a particular company or within a region where the legislation is the same so you can put it in procurement requirements or something like that and then I think my, my third point would be, then we really need to ensure that all these modules fit together. And that's not in the grant design, it's much more pragmatic that we then have proven ways of putting them together. It's a little bit like a Lego set. You know that you can build a castle with this set pieces. You can also build something else because you can use the roof if you need a roof. So I, I think we will have a much more modular approach to the service delivery. And that can scale. That can also scale depending on, you know, the economy of the region, uh, the technical capabilities and so on. So it's, it's much more robust, I think, in creating an actual market, which is not just pushing, you know, grant standards onto poor civil servants. Thank you very much. It's interesting. So modularize and then localize. They come up with more mosaic type of uh, structure in the, you know, local specific way. Yeah, so, <laughs> I don't know if you can see it, but actually this is a mosaic uh, of, yeah, yeah. of the, the cities of, of Fawask. So that, that is exactly the, the vision. It, it's, it's much easier to integrate also because of the political cycles, the financial cycles, they never match. So you need something when you need it. Great idea. Thank you very much. Okay, so what about you, Chris? Yeah, Martin and Morrison are really, really uh, raised good points in terms of tailor fitting the tailor fitting and really looking at the localized level in terms of the approach. So going back to your question about what was the priorities in terms of building smart, smart cities and 
I guess what I would like to go back is the presentation, the, the, the top three challenges that I presented earlier. So first, uh, Martin already mentioned this. It, currently, the approach is too technology-centered. So especially in developing countries, we are burdened by legacy, legacy systems. And I think most of the governments are burdened by legacy systems that really do not talk to each other, right? Yet, we still continue to procure you know, systems on top of uh, on top of each other. So with this, I guess from from Smart City, what I would like, what we would like to share, would be the tailored um, assessment that we created. So we created a tailored assessment in terms of Smart City maturity. So perhaps the the community can work, you know, like see this particular maturity and adopt the ones that can be adopted from um, can can be can be applied to their to their cities itself. So we're still revising the last year's one to make it more concise and make it more accessible. So the second problem that I've mentioned during my presentation is the data problem. So notably, most ASEAN, most, I think I mentioned this already, most ASEAN countries lack the city level data portals. So national data sets cannot be really transferred or translated to city level data sets, which is a really problem, not only for the public sector, but for the investors, for the private sector as well. So this is a huge issue for planners, for investors and such. Um, and in, in, in our case, in Smart City, we were able to pass the first city level um, policy in terms of making open data um, uh, what they call this, oh, the, the first open data po policy, which makes every data machine readable. So we can share that as well as a, you know, perhaps a template and adopt, you know, the, the cities can adopt as well. Um, we're also planning for a project aggregating, you know, the aggregating the public data in the Philippines to a subnational level. So this will greatly benefit the public and the private sectors. And I guess I can share this with the community as well in terms of our approach, because our approach really is from the ground up rather than you know, the top-down approach. And third, um, going back to the challenge is the buy-in. There's no buy-in really um, from the public sector, uh, from the public. So Martin already mentioned this earlier, the culture it's her, itself. So the, our long, as mentioned in my presentation, our long-term objective is to boost data literacy and digital literacy of the community. So the public should be included from the start, not only in the implementation. Currently, the public suddenly is bombarded. Okay, every, the, a project is being implemented already. So um, we can share this as well. We're, we're creating... Um, a, a tailored version in terms of how can you really how can you really educate people from the from without any particular knowledge in terms of technology so again i want to emphasize here uh you can't consult people on topics that they don't understand so this is really an important <laughs> strategy that we should really have so that's it. That's you know first the uh, tailored and open assessment that we have. I'm I'm willing to share the our approach in terms of the city level public data sets and of course the data literacy. Thank you very much, Chris. So you know to talk about the kind of low hanging fruits, maturity assessment approach can be shared across the nations, right? So maybe you can talk about that later. And also you talk about kind of buy in from the people for the data sharing purposes, you know, the data aggregation purposes. And uh, let's talk about, you know, people engagement after this. This is very, very important to, uh, topic to talk about. So it's all go back to the human centricity ideas, people engagement ideas. So maybe, you know, uh, besides the technology, you know, technology tend to be available all the time, but rather the question lies in that, how can you mobilize people? How can you get the heart of the people? for you know the smart city implementations how do you engage people to the smart city ideas um what is the what is the practice you have what, what is the maybe concern you have let's talk about you know the people engagement side uh mori -san, you have any, anything to share sure um yeah as everyone mentioned i believe that the communication between citizens and the city government is very important 
as well as you know, the communication within the city government. Now, even if the city-led city -led smart city projects um, are expected to satisfy citizens' real needs and public interest, um, these projects should not go ahead without having a communication or dialogue between stakeholders, including citizens and, um, and private companies originating from the city. And the city government must listen to the voices um, of the people who live there. Um, and uh, in Scuba, we, are, we have succeeded in building a very good relationship with citizens in our priority area. Um, the very, you know, the aging, um, advancing areas in the northern part of Tsukuba and the southern part of Tsukuba. The head of this area, um, as, well as, as well as persons in charge of, um, of, the, of this area, are very cooperative um, in terms of the promotion of the smart city or super city in Tsukuba. And uh, amazingly, they designated a person in charge of smart city within their resident association, you know, resident committee. So I must say that good communication is, is very important. And uh, to achieve, you know, to, in order to get um, to build this kind of, you know, good relationship, you know, one tip, uh, only one tip, just, you know, go to the local community and uh, have a discussion. You know, honest discussion is very important. What is the challenge? And review everything we are we are has, uh, you know we are has facing um, to promote the smart city, not um, uncover the negative point, but to review everything. I think that's a very important thing. Thank you very much. And uh, Martin and Chris and maybe myself are sitting on the side of the smart city ecosystem supporting, right? We are the kind of evangelists to share the ideas and promote the collaborations and also raise trust amongst the stakeholders. What do you say, uh, Martin, uh, from the uh, you know, support us standpoint, what's the uh, tools or methodologies or you know, the uh, approaches to enhance the people engagement? I think you said the key word and that is trust. I don't think it's possible to promote technology Nobody cares. I mean, you can, you can get fired for choosing wrong, but you can never get promoted for choosing right. Then stuff just works. <clears throat> you can get put out of office if you are mayor, if something goes wrong, but you never get elected for choosing technology. Uh, this, I think, is pretty consistent. Of course, you can create you know, a positive uh, communication around it, but at the end of the day, as the colleagues also said, it's about delivering results. And of course, there's short term and there's longer term. And the problem here is that we are actually addressing um, a problem which isn't apparent now. This is not disaster management. We, we can just see we will have problems if we don't start building these kind of infrastructures. We will not be using taxpayers' money efficiently and we will not be relevant in the global economy. So jobs, cultural identity reflected, and of course the whole climate situation, that's, that's our needs in different ways, differs everywhere you go. So the, the really difficult part is you have to create results here and now, and then in a way that projects to where you want to be in 10 or 20 years. So there are also, I think the dialogue, of course, I mean, I come from, from you know, uh, <clears throat> the participatory design world in Scandinavia, all about dialogue and co-creating. But Chris, what you said, you need, you need to understand what is the problem in order to be able to discuss it. So I think the key word is trust and then as, as we also heard from the Japanese colleagues, that you consult, what are the concerns? So I really like, you know, the super city concept where you have to have consultations before and after and so on, but you don't necessarily get the, uh, the, the precise recommendations out of the consultations, but you get, you know, what is the pain points of, of the public? 
And then, of course, you need to make some bold, perhaps, but concrete government decisions on the region or the, the national level, and, and then implement some things because you think that's in line with what you know, the citizens need. So you have to have this boldness to then interpret what would the citizens need in five or 10 years. And that comes back to trust. If you get that mandate, okay. And probably you put, shouldn't put all your eggs in one basket technology wise, mm -hmm. right? So, so I think the key word here is really trust and then each day delivering meaningful results. And that includes sometimes not using technology when you have a problem so that the public can see, okay, we use it when it's relevant. Thank you very much. So mantra is trust. Thank you very much. I think so too. Right, uh, Chris, how about you? Yeah, thanks, Jack. Uh, there's really no better way to put it, uh, Martin. So it's really trust. So I'd, I'd like to add that, you know, citizen engagement is even more, uh, as, as Martin mentioned, even more important than flashy technologies. Uh, so on to your question, I guess, first, I want to say that in my experience in the Philippines in Asia, people are disengaged because they cannot really relate to it. If you talk about smart city, they can't really relate to it. If you talk about technology, they can't really relate to it. So people are really disengaged. So we should ask ourselves, what does it really mean to the public, which are the users and the beneficiaries of this very smart city concept? So in, in my organization, we combine, you know, language translation, as I've mentioned, we always translate our documents to the local language. So that's really important. And another important thing to note is have a concise publication materials. <laughs> People do not really want to read, you know, pages and pages of, of, of materials. So we, we combine that to our, you know, in, in our efforts. So next would be... Um, I would say there's uh, there's an issue. I mean, it's part of the culture of Asia. Another issue that I notice is that the projects, contacts, and progress cannot really be accessed easily. So for some reason, they it's it's difficult for the public to contact the project leaders of this particular smart city projects. The public usually, as I mentioned earlier, the public usually learns learns the, about, about the project when it's implemented already or it's in implementation. That's why in Smart City, in my organization, what we really push for is an open approach in terms of Smart City. So what does it mean? The people can join and contribute um, during the, the, the project. So even in the planning itself, before you procure anything, the people should really be involved. So the medium really depends on the community as well. Be it, you know, Facebook, where in, in the Philippines, Facebook is really, you know, it's, it's, it's most of the people use Facebook, be it, you know, GitHub, be it an app. So it should really depend on the community as well. So again, um, this is easier said than done. You know, as Martin said, it's really trust. It's easier said than done especially in Asia, we're in top-down thinking is already part of the culture. But um, I guess at the end of the day, uh, I, I again want to put emphasis that you can't say that you consulted the people um, if uh, the, that, that particular, like the public itself, um, the, the subjects that you're talking to aren't really generally understood. So that's really, we, we need to really inculcate it in our minds before we say that, okay, we engage the people, but they really don't understand what we're talking about. So that's it for me. Okay, thank you very much. But anyway, so we, we began discussion around, uh, you know, citizen engagement. That It sounds like uh, we should continue talking this over the years, not just by today. Right, so it's the ongoing uh, topic to talk about. And uh, in the interest of time, I think we have to conclude with that. Thanks uh, for Matsumas. Uh, this is just the beginning of the journey, joint journey. So we will continue this journey together going forward. Okay, so Matsumas-san, please, for the final words. <laughs> okay, I'm muted. Uh... 
Thank you. It was very nice to uh, be a part of this discussion. So my final words is that the smart city has been uh, has to be uh, locally based and reflecting the citizens' needs and human centered. That's that's my yes. That's everything I want to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right. So you know we have more time actually. Oh but, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> We are joined across Asia, Europe, and Japan. Uh, keep talking to each other. Okay, thank you very much. This concludes this session. Thank you for joining us.